Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri and head of prophetic research ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. I want you to be praying for us in our ministry. Uh, this week I'll be going to Lexington, South Carolina and be talking about uh, Dan Brown's new book, The Lost Symbol, and be covering some of the things we talked about there. And, and uh, I'm going to be flying out Wednesday and I've been practicing. Uh, I've been kind of working out, getting ready for my flight. So here's the exercise. Here's the, here's the thing I've been practicing. You know what that is, don't you? That's that full body scan now that they're probably going to start implementing in all the airports. Uh, here's an article that says, Airports slow to receive whole body imaging scanners. Only 19 U.S. airports have received sophisticated imaging machines that can detect explosives hidden in clothing. Security experts say the scanners may be the best defense in stopping attacks such as an attempt to bomb a Detroit-bound aircraft Christmas Day. The Transportation Security Administration wants to install more of the devices known as whole-body imaging scanners, but the agency has met resistance from civil liberties groups, passengers, and some members of Congress. It never ceases to amaze me the political, rec the, the political correctness that runs this country. We live in such a time today where we cannot offend anybody. This is why the churches are in the shape they're in. Nobody wants to offend anybody. Today is Sunday. I'm recording this on Sunday. And I just preached a message here at our church. Uh, I'm going to try to have it posted on our website uh, probably before too long. But it's about a spirit of rebellion that's in our country. And we have a tremendous spirit of rebellion in the United States of America. It has basically formed the generation of youth that we have coming up uh, in our country. And it was a pretty hard sermon is what it was, and it was intended to be that way. And I had someone, we had a visitor here this morning who thanked me for telling it like it is, and I told them, I said, I didn't always used to be that way, but uh, God just sort of made us this way. But when are we going to stop being politically correct in our churches? When are we going to stop this political correctness in our, in our world? The, the endangerment that we face as Americans is not, has, is not and has not been, on, for the most part, from other Americans. The people who have consistently tried to blow up the airplanes coming in and out of this country have been Muslim terrorists. They should have nailed this guy back wherever he came. What was it, Nigeria or something like that? They should have nailed this guy as he was trying to get into the Netherlands. They, they should have nailed this guy as he was trying to get into the United States of America. But nobody did their job, either wittingly or unwittingly. I mean, I don't know if somebody was paid off. I don't know if there is, I don't know if there is a conspiracy related to this. But the people charged with doing their job should have done their job. It's not my fault. It's not the businessman's fault who wants the security of his nation, who wants to be able to get on an airplane without having to worry that it's going to blow up in midair. But it is a group of people. This is not racist. This is philosophical. It is a group of people that have been raised under a certain mindset that their religion, uh, if you don't fall under their religion, then you have to be killed. That's the opposite of Bible Christianity, but that's what's invading our country right now. And with a Muslim-loving president, we live in such a politically correct environment that we can't even look in the direction of these people for fear that somebody's going to complain that we're, uh, what is it they call profiling them. And so the answer to that is to basically undress every human being that gets on an airplane in the United States of America. And I don't go along with that. We are losing our freedom. Did you, have you ever noticed that we're losing our freedoms in this country? Have you ever noticed that we're losing our rights? We're losing um, the things that we most cherish in this country. It's not that they're being taken away from us. It's that what I hear is that most Americans are willing to to give them up. You know, you watch the talking heads on television and you hear them talk about this attempted bombing that took place and you'll hear some of these people saying, well, if it means keeping me safe on an airplane, sure, I'll let them pat me down. Sure, I'll let them do this. Sure, I'll let them do that. We are willing to trade in. We, we are so far removed from our founding fathers in this country. We're talking about men who were willing to die. We're talking about men who as they signed the Declaration of Independence, they, they realized that more than likely they would never live long enough to see the freedom that they were signing for on July 4, 1776. 
A lot of America is so far removed from that concept. We don't want to give up our wealth, our prosperity, our health. We don't want to give up our jobs. We don't want to give up anything in this world, and yet we want everything to be given to us. We want safety. We want health. We want, we want all of these things, and we are willing in this country to trade in what should be the most valuable possession that we have in America. No, it's not our bass boat. It's not three cars in our garage. It's not our two-story house. The most valuable possession in this country is the freedoms guaranteed to us by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in the United States of America. But we're ready to trade it all in. We say keep us safe, keep us in a good job, keep lots of food on our table so we can stuff ourselves, and we'll be happy. I guarantee you there's people around the world who live in countries under oppression that would give up everything that they had. In fact, have, historically, they have over the years given up everything they had for the opportunity to live in poverty in the United States of America. What have we come to in this country? Uh, so we're giving up our rights in the airports. We're giving up our rights. I don't have my cell phone on me today. We're giving up our rights to privacy when we have a conversation or to be private in our, in our papers and our effects. We're giving up those rights. We're telling the government, go ahead, scan everything that we do, look at everything that we do. We don't care. Just keep us safe. That is totally opposite of what our country was founded on. And so here, the President of the United States, Barack uh, Obama, is signing away yet more of our freedoms. Christian people, decent people, moral people, have a right to be free. They have a right to choose how they're governed. They have a right to choose who's policing them. And in this country, you see, there's, I, I like... I like the barriers that our founders placed in the Constitution. Um, there's a doctrine, that, and it said this for a long time, that said you should never use the military to police the streets of the United States of America. You should never do that. And I, I used to think a long time ago, I used to think, well, yeah, we need some military guys in there that'll kick some tail in this country. There's a difference between the military and, trained, and a trained police force. A trained police force, a police officer is trained. They may not be good at it, but they're trained to show restraint in getting someone into custody. An army person, a military person, they're trained to kill. They're trained to protect and they're trained to kill. So we don't want to unleash military people into the streets of the United States of America to police our streets. That's not a good idea. It's not indicative of of a free state, of a free country. We have restrict. you know, I don't know how it is in your area, but in our area, we elect a sheriff. And if that sheriff runs, goes for four years and we don't like the job he did, we boot him out of office and we elect somebody else, somebody else that will represent us and the standards of our community. But here's what Obama's doing. And this, this really got me uh, this week. Obama gives foreign cops new police powers in the United States. Now, I'm going to stop right here. Obama gave them power. I have not given them power. Let me read the article. A little discussed executive order from President Obama giving foreign cops new police powers in the United States by exempting them from such drudgery as compliance with the Freedom of Information Act is raising alarm among commentators who say Interpol had already had most of the same privileges as diplomats. At David Horowitz's newsreel, Michael Van Der Galien said the issue is Obama's expansion of President Ronald Reagan's order from 1983 that originally granted those diplomatic privileges. Reagan's order carried certain exemptions requiring that Interpol operations be subject to several U.S. laws, such as the Freedom of Information Act. Obama, however, removed those uh, restrictions in his December the 16th Amendment to the Executive Order 12425. That means, Van der Galen wrote today, quote, this foreign law enforcement organization can operate free of an important safeguard against government and abuse. Property and assets, including the organization's records, cannot be searched or seized. Their physical locations are now immune from U.S. legal or investigative authorities, he wrote. Um, so here's, here's basically the deal on this. 
We have uh, a, an international agency, Interpol, a policing and investigating organization that now has like a blank check in our nation. They can come in here, they can police, they can investigate, they can do anything they want to. Uh, Ronald Reagan, I don't know why he did what he did. But anyway, they had some restrictions placed on them. One was the ability for Americans to find out exactly what they're doing under the Freedom of Information Act. I like the Freedom of Information Act. It means that we as citizens have the right to go and look at what our government is doing. To release documents, as long as they're not of a national security related matter, we have the right to go and see what our government is doing and what they've got up their sleeve. But now Interpol comes in. Who's running Interpol? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know who's in charge of Interpol. I don't know what nation or conglomerate or syndicate or secret society. I don't know who runs this thing. I don't know who they answer to, but they don't answer to the citizens of the United States of America. People, we were born to be free. We were born higher than this. We were born to have freedoms given to us by our Creator. We were born to enjoy those freedoms and never sell them out. But this is what we've done. Our president, and you have to respect the office, but he is the wrong president for this country. He is selling out the freedoms the protections that we have in our government and in our society, society, he's selling them out. Now, I will say that Obama is just one in a line of men, presidents, congressmen, judges, that over the years, they've sold our country out. We used to be a free people. We no longer can be free in a nation such as this. I wonder how it's going to turn out. Well, this was amazing to me when I saw this. Uh, this is from uh, General Electric. GE first to announce water heaters that will meet new Department of Energy star standards. So now I want, you to, I want you to think about this. I want you to get this. I'm not going to read the whole article because I'm not going to be an advertising agent for General Electric. But I want you to think about this. Here is GE. Their CEO, Jeffrey M. Melt, is sitting on Barack Obama's board of geniuses, people that are telling him what they, what they think he ought to do. And so here's the, the head of uh, General Electric who already has stuff in place. In other words, they probably drew up plans for this new water heater. They've got some new water heater now that's going to comply with all these new standards. Where did these standards come from? They came from General Electric. And so you think about this. Here's General Electric. General Electric says, we've got, all the, we've got all the plans and all the stuff that we need for these new products. It's about sales. And so we're going to sit on Obama's board and we're going to outlaw everybody else's products. And so that's what they did. So Jeffrey M. Melt gets on Obama's board of geniuses, tells Obama, Obama, you know, we're killing the environment. Why don't you, uh, why don't you make a law like cap and trade and have new standards put in place to where, you know, all these... Terrible, terrible environmental angry products are destroying the environment. Why don't you outlaw them? Obama says, yes, that's a great idea. We'll save the planet. We'll save the country. And so it's no surprise to me that GE is the first to announce water heaters that will meet new Department of Energy star standards. GE wrote the standards to, so that they could sell I hope you understand how this goes. We, we have a situation in our country. you never seen me without my glasses, have you? We have a situation in our country where it's not we the people. It's we the corporations. We the special interest groups. Those are the ones that are getting the laws passed that are enacting the new legislation. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. You want to get to the basis of the corruption that's in this country? It's the love of money. It's very, very simple. The Bible's right 100% of the time. And oh, by the way, Rick Warren's in the news, you know, talking about money. Uh, Mega church pastor appeals for nearly $1 million in donations. Lake Forest, California, evangelical pastor Rick Warren appealed to parishioners at his Orange County Megachurch Wednesday to help fill a 900000 deficit by the first of the year. My question is, 
Where in the Bible does it say that it cost a million dollars to reach people for Jesus Christ? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. I don't know if you've ever seen Rick Warren's campus. I, I've never been there, but I've seen pictures and I've had people call me. It's, it's huge. I mean, people, this, this place is humongous. They have... You know, you, you, we're used to going into like a church building. They have on this campus venues, they call them venues. And let's say that you're a teenager and you're 14 years old and you don't want to go to the boring adult church. So as your mom and dad goes into the main auditorium with their coffee, you go into the teen venue. And they have... I think at least five different venues on this campus, all operating on Sunday morning. And of course, you know, they do the music and they do all this stuff. And then here's Rick Warren on the jumbotron in each one of these buildings. Okay. They say, well, yeah, yeah, we, we you know, we're, we're doing God's work here. I think it's a, I think it's a shame. I, I thought it was a shame. You know, Oral Roberts just passed away. I thought it was a shame when Oral Roberts had the gall to get on television several years, I don't know if you remember this, back in the 80s, I think, and tell everybody that God told him that God was going to kill him if he didn't raise $5 million. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard that. Um, Robert Schuler, from time to time, has, has gone on pleading for people's money. We have to continue this ministry. God's given us such an important work. My view on this is, if God thought it was so important, how come he's not paying for it? Did the thought ever occur to anybody that if God's not funding your ministry, it's probably because God's not in it? And, um, I mean, I have a lot to say. Well, the, the truth of it is, I was watching the news this morning. He got the money. He not only got a million dollars, he got $2.5 million, and the checks are still rolling in so that he can carry on his hypocrisy in the name of Jesus, befriending the homosexuals, befriending the liberals, befriending people of all these other religions in the world, and refusing to give them the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shame on this guy. Um, but I'll tell you something. Money and the love of money and the gospel consistently over the years have not mixed very well at all. Yeah, it takes a little money to run a church. It takes a little money to run what we do around here. But I would say that if God's not funding your ministry, maybe that should be a sign that your ministry is not of God. Maybe that's too harsh, but we'll see. All right. We've got some paradigm shifts and some infusions and some God DNA to give you. And oh, by the way, at the end of the broadcast, you know, I started this last, uh, uh, last weekend uh, at the end of our Watchman video broadcast. I'm just kind of going over some of my old uh, presentations, some old teachings that I've done and just kind of kind of bring them up to date a little bit and kind of talk about it a little bit. So I hope this is a little enlightening for you. And oh, by the way, I got to do my exercise. You know, that way I can get ready, get ready for the body scanner at the... I, I hope they don't scan my body. I, uh, uh, you know, most of you, that all you've ever seen of me is, you know, behind this camera. And, you know, from this direction here, it all, you know, I look pretty dignified, okay? But uh, if I were to turn like this a little bit, you kind of see, you know, I don't want everybody looking at my body. Anyway, and so what if they can't see my face? My face is the best thing I got going for me. Uh, anyway, people, are, I mean, you guys are sending me stuff. I don't have to research this uh, broadcast very much at all. You guys are doing it all for me. Uh, I feel guilty, but I appreciate what everybody sends me. You guys, you guys are watching. You guys got your eyes on what's going on, and you've learned some of the buzzwords uh, that, uh, let's see, where is she here? Oh, my goodness. Marilyn Ferguson has put out in the Aquarian Conspiracy. Some of the logo, things like paradigm shifts and infusion and community and all this stuff. And you're, you're keenly aware of this stuff. And so you're surfing the net and you're driving up and down the street and you're looking for things that are going on. Here's something called the International Coalition of Workplace Ministries. And they have an article that's called the Workplace Movement, 10 Paradigm Shifts Toward Community 
transformation. Uh, a small cloud is on the horizon. The winds of change are beginning to gather strength. And with certainty, a storm is coming. Change is coming. All over our world, there's a quiet movement of the Spirit of God that is causing believers to re-examine how they do church. Now, I want you to get the danger in this. They're saying that when they, trans, when they finally make a full transformation of the church, that it'll be, it'll be the Spirit of God, but it won't be. It'll be the spirit of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations. You know, all of, these, all of these new paradigm people in the church have this premise, and I want you to listen to this. They have this premise that everybody in the church has done it all wrong up until they showed up on the scene and they got this new thing going on. That is exactly what the Jehovah's Witness started out saying a hundred and some odd years ago, that everybody, of course everybody's wrong, all the churches are wrong and all the Bibles are wrong, and we're going we're gonna to set it straight. Joseph Smith, that's what he gained his, his whole basis of his religion on, was that God himself told him that, I mean, it's all wrong. Everybody's doing, been doing this all wrong, and you're going to come set it straight. Even the early Pentecostal, especially the United Pentecostal movement, uh, went around telling everybody that the gifts of the Spirit have been, have been held back by evil mankind, these evil preachers that have been holding down the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, they're going to restore Christianity to what it originally intended to be. And this is what these guys are doing. They have to tear down the old church structure in order to build a new one. Remember how Baphomet works. He's got salve written on one arm and coagula written on the other, which means you've got to dissolve before you can coagulate or before you can rebuild. And that is the key to what we see happening here. And so they say, all over our world there's a quiet moon of the Spirit of God that is causing believers to re-examine how they do church. Churches are throwing out the old measures of success. You know, like you know, people being saved and baptized, people, being, people living decent lives, they're throwing out the old measures of success. It no longer, it's no longer merely about size, sinker sensitivity, spiritual gifts, church health, nor the number of small groups. It's about making a significant and sustainable difference in the lives of people around us in our communities and in our cities. It moves on down uh, where they, they're talking about paradigm shift and community and transformation and all of these words that we learned were part of the New Age movement. Um, I call it New Age because it rhymes with sewage, and that's exactly what it is. And that's what's going on. Listen, go to these church websites, and they start talking about transformation and paradigm shift and community and fusion and God's DNA and all this stuff. Watch out for those rascals, because I think it's a setup heading into the last days. Somebody sent me this, and this has to do with this idea of infusion. And let me, uh, in case you don't really get this, let me, let me tell you what this means. This goes to the secret of Freemasonry, Daniel chapter 2, the infusion of Daniel's fourth kingdom with the seed of men. Uh, the angelic realm, the angels of the fourth kingdom, uh, being infused with the seed of men. That's Daniel chapter 2, and that's what happens with the fourth kingdom. The, the uh, logo, the Masonic logo of the square and compass, uh, basically gives you that idea. The compass pointing upward, the square pointing downward, the things of heaven fusing with the things of men. And so when you see fusion or infusion or all these things, that's exactly what it's talking about. But here's something, and here's something that I want to show you that kind of makes it all make sense because the, the spirit that is leading the infusion is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So somebody sent me this. Pastor Mike, take a look at this. This is the Infusion Dance Company. And I have to admit, when I saw this for the first time, I'm going, that looks like Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders is what it looks like to me. Um, these are ladies who, you know, forgive me, I'm just going to say it like it is. These are ladies that are doing lascivious dances in the house of God, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That's what they're doing. This does not glorify God. You cannot glorify God in the flesh. You cannot worship God in the flesh. But so many churches, I remember years ago, back, back even before I started this ministry, back even, uh, I, was, I think I was working in construction. Uh, and I had a little bit of sense back then. I was talking to a guy that was starting a new church. It was a Southern Baptist church out in this growing community in our county. 
And uh, we were actually doing the painting on his church, and I was talking to him a little bit. And he said, "Oh yeah," he said, "We're doing, we're just doing things different here. We're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have creative drama, and we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have dancing girls." And he didn't say dancing girls, but he was talking about creative artistic dance and stuff like that. And I'm just going, "That don't sound right to me. That doesn't sound like preaching the gospel to me." But this is what's being accepted in our church. E everything in the world except preaching the gospel, is now what's being accepted in our churches. Uh, let's see here. Here's another one from Abundant Life Ministries. They have a thing called Impact uh, Youth Ministries. The guy that sent me this said, uh, Pastor Mike, take a look at the all-seeing eye logo here of Impact Youth Ministries. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, yeah, I got that. You know, you know, he, he favors the undertaking of a new world order. Look at the back of your dollar bill. And I, I think that that's what that's part of. But there's something on down the road here uh, on this same website. These are all their children's groups now. Here's the one, Infusion Middle School. Uh, in the infusion idea. And then look at the, b below there, Light Force Children's Ministries. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Triangle, the All-Seeing Eye, Infusion. Uh, we, have, we have accepted this stuff as being you know, like positive for our kids. By the way, I'm, I'm kind of old-fashioned. In our church, I, I mean, I really, I, 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 you know, I try to be modern. I use technology, and uh, you know, I like my cell phone. But I am, I'm pretty old fashioned when it comes to church. I think at church time, kids ought to be in church. Is what I think. Um, I know that there are some good children's church ministries out there, and I'm not necessarily knocking that. But just for us here in our church. We have decided that you know I have people ask me you know can we start a children's church and. You know, I kind of toss it up every now and then. I'm going to seek God in it. But I, I just had this idea that I think kids can pick up more from a Sunday morning sermon than we give them credit for. And the new paradigm of the churches now is to brush them off down uh, into the new auditorium or the new gymnasium so they can have a rock concert, so they can have uh, all these sayings and, and getting almost nothing of the gospel of Jesus Christ and yet they, they talk about how many kids are being saved and baptized. Well, I've worked with kids long enough to know that you can have any kind of service, have an altar call, and you can get them down there. But look at the long-term effects that we're seeing in our young people today. Uh, here's a guy named Kim. Kim Clement. You know, I remember this guy from somewhere before. I don't know if I've talked about him before, but um, this really struck me. He's one of these guys. He's one of these punk rock Christian prophets that God speaks to and gives him prophecies and dreams and visions and all this stuff. And you remember, those of you that have done a little bit of research into the New Age movement, uh, you know that one of the core tenets of the New Age movement says that, uh, you know, when we move into the New Age, when the, uh, when, the, you know, when the angels fall from heaven and they come take over our bodies and our DNA, uh, when all these things happen, you know, we're going to enter a new age of enlightenment. But what's going to happen is, is that there are going to be some people that uh, are not going to go along with this, and we have to very quietly get rid of them, which means basically kill everybody off. And so I saw this. Uh, somebody sent me this, and I don't know that they saw what I saw, but here it is on Kim Clement's uh, website. He talks about the goals of his of, of uh, his ministry here to reach human beings with the message of Christ. Blah 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 blah. And then he said to re-educate those that have had a spiritual experience. Stop right here. What he means by that is: is anybody that believes the King James Bible and lives according to the standard of the Word of God, uh, and and was raised in a church that had something similar to that going on. This guy believes that they're they're crazy. There's something wrong with them. It's kind of like you know these the the National Education Association. These liberals think that all your kids are nuts because you trained them in the Bible. They said your kid is mentally ill. We need to re-educate your child. It kind of reminds you of communist re-education camps. But anyway, he's going to re-educate them by zapping them with something that he calls the Spirit of God. And they have this inner emotional feeling. And they go, ooh, ah, this is what Christianity was supposed to be. So anyway, to re-educate those who have had a spiritual experience, but have wandered into the religious doctrine of exclusivity, exclusivity, how do you pronounce it? Exclusivity. I don't know. Anyway, thereby make it, I don't even know that it's a word. Exclusivity. Exclusivity. 
I'm not going to edit this out. I think it's funny. Thereby, <laughs> thereby making them spiritually redundant and a menace to society. He's talking, he's talking about me. He, he's, ta he's talking about you. Think of, think of the Communist Party. They go into Russia. They go into China. They're going to have to re-educate everybody. And if you won't go along with it, then you, here, and here's what you'll hear from Rick Warren and that crowd. You're, a, you're, a, you're not community-oriented. You're not just willing to go along. You're not passive enough for our New World Order Church and our New Age movement that we're putting in our church. And so this guy comes out with a very bold statement that says, if you can't be re-educated, then you are a menace to society. You remember in the 90s when all that stuff was going around about, you know, the red list and the green list and the yellow list and things like that. And people on the red list are people that can't be re-educated. So we're going to shoot them right off the bat during martial law. You remember that? And then some of the people on the yellow list or what is a blue list that, you know, maybe they'll go along. So we'll put them in re-education camps and we'll really work on them. Try to get them into the new paradigm. This is what's going on in church. And some of you know, some of you know for a fact, because you were part of a church and the pastor came in and said, we're going to we're going to bring a new paradigm in here. We're going to do all things all different. And we want everybody to be part of the community, like communism. And then you dare to stand up and say, this is not right. I don't think we ought to do this. I don't think this is of God. Have you done your research? Do you know what Rick Warren stands for? And, and all of a sudden, you're a danger to the small group. You're a danger. You are a menace to society. I've been talking about... Um, you know, I, I mentioned last year that I was going to do a video on camps. And I still have that in mind, and I think, I think last night I got an idea of, of what direction I want to go in it. And it has, and I believe, I believe in the camps. I believe in the FEMA camps. Don't get me wrong, but I think there's a lot of misinformation going on about there. And I think that you and I as Christians, I think we ought to have the right attitude about it. I think that in the future, if they initiate this idea of, you know, taking people into FEMA camps, I think we ought to go along with it. Study the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong on this. I believe in freedoms. I believe in standing up. I believe in all these things. Study the Scriptures. Study persecution in the Bible. God's people have always been persecuted at the hands of of wicked people. That goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. The blood of God's people has always been shed by those who are evil and wicked and abominable in God's sight. But I want you to think about how the gospel was spread in the days of Jerusalem when there were 3,000 plus saints in Jerusalem all going to church and nobody was going to Judea. What happened? God sent the persecutors in, and they all went out preaching. Maybe we need to rethink our strategy or our philosophy concerning the days that are coming. Maybe instead of fearing the days that are ahead, let's look forward to them as the greatest opportunity in the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying I'm right on this. I'm saying let's study the Scriptures. Here's another one I thought was interesting. This is actually from a Baptist church now. A Baptist church. Um, their upcoming recharge series, anything like with the word re in front of it, that means they're going to redo it, reinvent it, revolution is what they're talking about. And so now here they have redefining culture. And it says, it seems today that so many people are defined by what they do, what they wear, and who they know. Our culture also seems to miss out on the true meanings of certain things. In late November, exchange students will seek to redefine these concepts. Number one, one redefining cool. Number two, redefining truth. Thy word is truth. They're going to redefine what this means. It gets better. Redefining worth, redefining love, and redefining Jesus. Southern Baptist Church doing this one. Okay. Uh, here's the Lighthouse Church. 
Uh, here they are using DNA. Five primary ideas make up our focus here at the Lighthouse. They represent the spiritual DNA of our church family. It just amazes me uh, how this DNA, it seems, it's kind of like maybe they've watched our videos. I don't know, you know. Maybe, maybe they did. I don't know. Uh, Denver Community Church. Notice the Triple Helix logo here. A holistic... In fact, let me just put this, you know, next to this here. And uh, so here we have... We see, we're using the same logo here, okay? And we're using the same words, holistic. I get it, okay? I mean, I get this. A holistic Christian missional community. It's a New Age church. Masquerading. Masquerading. You remember, you remember, um, oh, where is it? Uh, I know it's in the Bible somewhere. Uh, be sober, be vigilant. First Peter. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Why is he a roaring lion? Revelation 10. I believe that's Jesus. If you get our video on the clouds, you'll know why I believe it's Jesus. But he opens his mouth and he roars as a lion worth. Remember, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So if Jesus is the lion, why is the devil as a roaring lion? He's masquerading. He's making people think that he's a lamb. But he's not. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh, here's another one. Christians practicing yoga. Uh, this webpage has all kinds of things on it. Um, Three holistic benefits, yamas, niyamas, and pranayama. Now, I don't know anything about that, but that just looks like Eastern mysticism to me. Uh, the implications of incarnational faith, call for embodiment, yoga and healing, Lectio Divina. There you go, right there. Uh, passage, meditating, uh, chanting, all of this stuff. There, but I, in fact, I'll just say this. This whole website's a lie. There, there is no such thing as Christian yoga. There, there is no such animal. You cannot be saved and born again and be sober in your mind, led by the Spirit, and practice yoga and be warned about it and spe specifically be warned about it and keep going on in it. Uh, this is from uh, Lighthouse Trails Research. It's an excellent website to go to if you want to do research on uh, the uh, meditation prayer practices that are going on. There's certain people in different realms of quote unquote Christianity that are that are um, they're transformational in nature. They're bringing about the paradigm shifts, and they also seek out familiar spirits because they do this meditational prayer practice called contemplative prayer. There are certain proponents of this. One of these guys was a man by the name of of Stuart or Lance Witt. Uh, he used to be Saddleback's pastor of spiritual maturity. Now, the thing is, is that Lawrence Witt now has gone to work for Jonathan Falwell. You remember Jerry Falwell's son? You see, watch this now, okay? For whatever you think about Jerry Falwell, at one time, and I heard a sermon, at one time Jerry Falwell used to shell down the corn. That's how we say it down in Arkansas. He used to shell down the corn when it came to preaching. And he would not apologize to anybody. As he got older, I think the influence of the money that was coming in sort of changed him a little bit. But when he died, I had a gut feeling, and you know I've got a lot of guts to feel with. I had a gut feeling that his son, Jonathan, was not going to carry on even some of the standards that Jerry Falwell had left behind. And I was right. So here now Lance Witt, a contemplative prayer, a someone who is in contact with familiar spirits is now going over to um, Jonathan Falwell's team over there in, uh, in Virginia. Um, you see, this idea is, is that you have an old preacher and he is a roadblock to what the devil wants to do. And you guys, I, I've heard this from a thousand people, if I've heard it from one. They always tell me, Pastor Mike, um, you know, I don't know what to do about our church because, I mean, we had a pastor and I thought he was good, but he left or he resigned or he got caught in some scandal or he was just too old and we got a new pastor. That's how it always starts, people. That's how it always starts. And it makes sense now the number of times in all the years that I've been here how the devil has tried one way or the other to get me out of this place. 
I could not even begin to tell you the ways that he's tried to do it. Uh, depression, uh, I mean, all kinds of things. And, you know, it dawned on me one time a long time ago. You know, I was just, I mean, I was just depressed. I mean, just under like a deep spiritual depression. And I prayed about it. And God, why? You know, God was, I mean, just, and I wanted to, I just wanted to leave. And God reminded me of a verse, Mike, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And as soon as it dawned on me what was going on, I mean, I got my Popeye outfit and I got me a can of spinach and I went out and I fought the devil. And I've had to do that many times since then. And I'm glad, and I cannot say for one second that I've stayed around here by the strength of my will. I just wouldn't let the devil get that kind of victory. That's not how it was with me, people. How it was with me was that I just fell on my face toward God because I couldn't, I couldn't go. I couldn't make it. And God has always seen fit to preserve me uh, for better or for worse and to keep me here to protect the sheep that are in this fold. But a lot of you telling me, you know, Pastor Mike, you know what happened was our pastor left and we got a new pastor in. And that's usually how it goes. Uh, here's something. Uh, Michael down in Florida sent me this, and uh, I'm not sure what he was looking at, but I caught, you see, I've just been thinking about this the other day. Uh, it is uh, the ministry of, uh, I don't know, something. Anyway, they've got one of these Infuse ministries going on here. But what caught my attention was their logo here of Thaw 2010. And as soon as I saw that, I had just been thinking about that the other day, and I'm going, okay, I get it. Now, I want you to think about this. Thaw is when something is frozen, and it goes from frozen to solid, or excuse me, liquid. Um, at what temperature does water cease to be frozen and become thawed? In the process of going, watch this now, from 32 to 33 degrees. That's the Freemason thing, okay? Uh, the, they're frozen into 32 degrees, but they're thawed and let out. Uh, you know, I just caught that. Anyway, here's another one. Infusion Ministries presents Infusion Night. Come get infused <coughs> by the Holy Ghost. You know, they make it look like everybody's going to go up there and they're going to get an IV. Oh, I'm getting the Holy Ghost in me, okay? Uh, but we all know what it means, infusion. And by the way, it's at... Uh, Maybe I already go to this. It's at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. You know, I'm going to Lexington, South Carolina this week. I wonder if I'll get to go to Myrtle Beach and swim in the ocean. Nah, too cold. Uh, anyway, here's another one. Infused Ministries. I mean, we're just seeing this stuff all over the place. I don't want to take up a lot of time with this. Um, but I'm going to... Uh, this is the last thing. Somebody sent me this, and I just had to laugh. Horizon Auto Center. I don't know where this is. Well, it looks like Texas, state of Texas. Uh, free Nobel Peace Prize with oil change. I love it. I love it. Free Nobel Peace Prize. Maybe I can go get one of those. A Nobel Peace Prize. Um, anyway, I want to talk about the Bible. And then I've got something I want to probably throw in here at the last. Somebody sent me this. And I, at, at first, I was, I was kind of uh, wary about where it was going. But I got a video I want to show you. And I watched it yesterday in my office. And um, Every now and then, something will make me break down and cry, and, and I'm a man, uh, but I broke down and cried yesterday. One of my favorite songs in the whole world, one of my favorite groups of songs in the whole world is Handel's Messiah. I'm not just talking about the Hallelujah Chorus, I'm talking about the whole thing. Uh, to me, there's no greater, I'm going to use this word fusion, no greater mixture of scripture and music than Handel's Messiah. Um, it, it brings out the scriptures in such, and it's King James Bible based. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a video I want to show you at the end of the Hallelujah Chorus, and I, I think you're going to like this. I did, and I appreciate whoever sent it. I, I know who sent it to me. I just can't think of their name right now. Uh, anyway, let's talk about Bible doctrines. We talked last week about the, the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. Is the Bible inspired? Yes. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that means that it is God-breathed. That means that when you read the Bible, 
That's God. That's God talking. How, you know, when you read it in whatever voice is in your head, if it, you want it to be Charlton Heston, then fine, it'll be Charlton Heston. But I'm telling you, when you read the Bible, it is the voice and the breath and the mouth and the Word of God. No other book can lay claim to that. Handel's Messiah is only good in so much that the lyrics come from the Scriptures. Okay, That's why I like it so much. But anyway... A lot of people, a lot of ministries, a lot of preachers say, well, you know, we believe in, you know, in the inspiration of the Bible. But they stop right there. They stop with that faith statement that says, we believe the scriptures are, are, are the inspired word of God in the original manuscript. And then they stop right there. Because they don't want to come out and admit, and I'll tell you, any doctrinal statement that you have that you can't come out and admit openly, there's something wrong with your doctrine. That's mystery religion. But anyway, um, I believe in the doctrine of the inspiration of the Scriptures, so I believe the original manuscripts were the inspired Word of God. But biblically, I cannot stop there. I have to keep going. I have to keep going. And you know, I have people just say, oh, I wouldn't go that far. I would. I would. I go that far because the Bible tells me to not only believe in the inspiration of the Scriptures, but the preservation of the scriptures. They not only were inspired, they have been preserved. Let's look at the scriptures. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. How simple can it be? I mean, how, how, what, what further evidence do you need to believe that God not only inspired His Word, but He always intended to preserve it? You know, what, what gets me is that, you know, there's quite a few of you that espouse uh, what, what is commonly called eternal security, the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And, and I think that there are varying degrees of, of what people believe in that. But it's real funny to me that the large, the lar in fact, the largest Protestant denomination in our country, the Southern Baptist Movement, lays claim to believing in the eternal security. In other words, that God can preserve a believer and they'll never lose their salvation. And yet most of them don't even believe that God could even preserve a book. I mean, that to me, that does not make sense. If you believe that God preserves the souls of mankind and he never leaves them out of his hand, why is it that you're telling people that God, even you know, once you're saved, you're saved? Oh, you know, the Bible. Well, yeah, you know, we've lost words out of that. You know, God couldn't preserve that. That's crazy. Why do you think that way, you King James only people? That's what they're saying about us. That, and how do I know? Because I used to be on that side of it. I used to believe the way they believe. I used to believe that there was mistakes in the Bible and that, that we didn't have the original manuscript. So don't even argue manuscript evidence with me because we don't have the originals. We don't know what the... I would say that we don't know what they said. Boy, was I wrong. You see, I never, I never read this verse. As I'm forming this idea in my mind that I think all the Bible's corrupt, I never, I never remember ever reading, never had it taught to me in Bible college that the words of the Lord are present tense, are right now pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Let me let me deal with that just for a second. Um, some some people say, you know, you know, Pastor Mike, did you have you ever heard this thing that you know there are like seven English translations until the King James? Well, I don't know that. I mean, I really don't know that. I, I think there's some discrepancies there. What I do know is that from 1604, from the the moment the decree came from King James to 1611, that's seven years. Okay, a time in the Bible is a year, and so here they are. The King James Editing Committee, committee, and they're translating. They're moving. They're translating in a circular form, and they're all doing peer reviews of each other's work. And it goes through this whole purification process, comparing the former translations because that's what God said they had to do. Second Peter chapter one: No scriptures of any private translation. That's what interpretation means. Uh, but anyway, it was purified for seven years. And now we have the complete, perfect Word of God. It has zero mistakes in it whatsoever. God not only said it was perfect in the originals, He said it will always be 
perfect. It's not the corruptible seed. It is the incorruptible Word of God. Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. That's the doctrine of the preservation of the Scriptures. Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, my words, all of them, will not pass away. They shall not. Ever, ever. We should, we should, as Christians, have never, ever believed that the Bible was corrupted. We should have never believed that because that's not, that may have been what we was taught. But that's, we should have never accepted that as doctrine. We should only accept the idea that His words would never pass away. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before. All Scripture, here's 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is, present tense, right now, given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then it goes on to say that the man of God may be perfect. Now, if you look in your NIV, you will see that in that passage there, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it omits the word perfect. Yet, forgive me, I just ate lunch. Um, it omits the word perfect, that the man of God may be perfect. Why did it omit the word perfect? Because if you do not have a perfect word making a perfect man, you will not have a perfect man. There's no way, there is no way in the world that you and I can be perfected without a perfect word. Can't do it, okay? There's no way that you and I will ever reach new life, new beginnings, heaven, and the perfection that comes with our new bodies if there is not a perfect word of God. It's not happening. So in these ministries faith statements, they say we believe the scriptures to be the inspired inerrant word of God in the original manuscripts. But, and here's what they won't put in their doctrinal statement, but transmissional errors, copyist errors, translational errors have crept in and we don't have a totally 100% perfect Bible. We don't have that. Okay? And all the arguments, and I, I usually don't get into arguments anymore about this issue. I just, I just walk away. Unless somebody sits down and says, Pastor Mike, please help me wrap my head around this. I, I want to believe it, but I just can't. And I'll talk to you about it. And I'll answer your questions. But in all the arguments that I've had in the past, no one, no one ever, ever, ever one time quoted Scripture to me to prove to me scripturally that God said there would ever be mistakes in the Bible. Show me the verse. In fact, you'd have to show me two of them because out of the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established. And I would have to see the Old Testament and the New Testament joining together to say, well, of course there's mistakes. There's going to be mistakes in the Bible. I mean, after all, I mean, it's just a book. And you'll see all kinds of organizations who will stop short at a less than perfect Bible. They'll make it sound good, but it won't be good. Here's uh, from Apologetics Press. Here's one of the arguments given by one of these Bible doubt casters who believe that the Bible is full of mistakes. They say, well-trained textual critics operating on the basis of sound methodology are able to rectify almost all all misunderstandings that might result from manuscript error. Well-trained textual critics. Seems to me that Westcott and Hort set the standard for well-trained textual critics. You know, these guys that were a member of the ghostly guild that were having seances. Um, seems to me that the training qualifications of someone who is a textual critic doesn't seem to have anything to do with whether they're saved or not. It has everything to do with how many degrees they've got, how many languages they know, and can they speak Greek, and can they parse verbs. You see, I remember that from my Greek training. Can they do all those things? Then they're well-trained textual critics. None of them full of the Holy Ghost. Operating on the basis of human methodology is what that means. Are able to rectify almost all misunderstandings. You know what? If they were building a bridge across the Grand Canyon and they said, we're going to open it up in 2010, and that, oh, you know what there is? There's like that new platform out over the Grand Canyon made of glass, which I don't know that I would get on. You can actually step out on it and be like over the canyon itself. Okay, I've seen it just like dangles in the air. 
So what if there was a, a notice before you got on that bridge that said, uh, well-trained engineers were able to rectify almost all the problems in building this bridge so that it would be safe. Would you get on it? There's not a chance in the world that I would get on that bridge. And yet they want you to base the eternity of your immortal soul on what well-trained, quote-unquote, human methodology critics say that they can do with almost all the Bible. I just don't buy that. I just don't buy it. Isaiah, here's those well-trained critics. Isaiah 29, 11. 11 is the number for confusion. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. See, the Bible to them is closed. And this is why their methodology doesn't come from the Bible, because the Bible's sealed up to them. It's closed. Uh, the original manuscripts, most of the original manuscripts were written on papyrus. That's where we get the word paper from. Papyrus is a type of grass. Now, I like this. God showed me this. I like this. You see, they took, they took big reeds and they split them in half and they wove them out and they dried them out and they made paper, papyrus. Okay? Then they wrote on them. Now, that was all well and good for about you know, 150 years. And then after that, they started, because, you know, grass. You know, when you mow the grass, it just doesn't last very long. God had this all figured out. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You see, the thing is, God was never really interested in preserving paper. He was interested in preserving His word. And He did. And He did a good job of it too. Zero mistakes in this book. And I'm going to tie something together for you. I'm going to show you this because I think it's relevant. And then I'm going to show you the Hallelujah Chorus. I just love this. Isaiah 28, verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Isaiah 28 deals with the drunkards of Ephraim, and wine and strong drink is indicative of false doctrine. The false doctrines that people are believing about the Bible is indicative of a drunken spirit that is poured out in this world. And what does he equate, equate their doctrinal standards to? Their glorious beauty is a fading flower. The drunken preachers, priests, people of this world are relying upon grass that withered to give them the truth. When I just believe that God, in spite of the fact that it was written on grass, has always found a way to preserve His Word. I want you to pray for us and pray for me this week as I travel and pray that God would give me safety and travel and pray that uh, there's not some Middle Eastern guy on the plane fidgeting with his underwear uh, in an attempt to blow the plane up. Uh, pray that God would give my family safety who have already run into a challenge. My daughter's car broke down today, already running into some challenges this week, and so just keep us in your prayers as we attempt to serve God this week in Lexington, South Carolina. I look forward to seeing many of you there. Some of you said you're going to be there. I probably won't know your face, but just in case when you see me, I'll be the guy that looks like, you know, me, okay? Anyway, look forward to meeting you there.